Okay, I am going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Liz Eberlein. I am the Education Programs Manager at the National Women's History Museum. Um, I know some of you have just sent me chat messages. Um, what I'm going to ask as we go through today um, is I have completely muted you all, um, so you're not going to be able to use your microphones to talk to me. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to wait until the very end of the program to ask your question. So as we go through, if you have something that you think about, um, anything that you want me to clarify, write it down and you'll be able to ask at the end. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to use the chat function to ask those questions at the end. Um, so you, you won't be able to use your microphone. So um, if you just refrain from sending any, um, sending any chat messages during the program, that way it, there's no distraction. Um, it looks like we've got one more person that's coming in right now. Um, I'm going to give it just another 30 seconds, just make sure we don't have any other stragglers, and then I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, um, so as I mentioned, my name is Liz Eberlein. I'm the Education Programs Manager at the National Women's History Museum. We are located in Alexandria, Virginia, um, but we are a museum currently without walls. So what we do are programs like this where we um, can bring you guys to the program and you can hear us talk about um, different aspects of, of women's history. Um, so the, today we're talking about um, the beginning of kind of the, the women's suffrage movement. Um, the program will give you a little historical background for the women's suffrage movement. It covers a lot of time. Um, it covers from about 1776 to just up until after the Civil War. So we end the very late 1860s, beginning of the 1870s. Um, so we'll be covering a large time period. There is a lot to talk about. So again, if you have any questions, as we go through, just write those down and I'll answer those at the very end of the program. Um, sounds good. I am going to go ahead and get started. Um, so um, starting in about 1776, in March of 1776, several months before the Declaration of Independence was written and the United States declares its independence from England, um, Abigail Adams, who is the wife of John Adams and the future First Lady of the United States, she writes her husband a letter. And in this letter, she says, and I'm going to quote, it says, and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. So about nearly 150 years before the passage of the 19th Amendment, before the passage of um, the um, giving women the right to vote, um, Abigail Adams is recognizing in this letter to her husband, um, and again, this is a private letter. She never, I'm sure, um, felt like this was going to be made public, but um, now that we have it, this was um, kind of a private first step in the fight for equal rights for women. Um, and very shortly after she writes this letter, um, the United States declares its independence from England. Um, and but it's not until 1787, when Delaware ratifies the U.S. Constitution, that we have our first state. And in every state, the legal status of women, um, of free women rather, depended on their marital status. So unmarried women, uh, which included widows, so if you were not married or if you were married and your husband died, um, these women, these unmarried women, were called femme souls or women alone. Um, and they had the legal right to live where they wanted and to support themselves in any occupation that did not require a license or a college degree, which at the time was restricted to just men. Um, and they could enter into contracts. They could buy and sell real estate. They could accumulate personal property. And personal property in this case could be something such as stocks, bonds, cash, livestock. Um, and then in the South, um, 
property could also include slaves. So these are all things that unmarried women, they could own on their own. And as long as women remained single, they retained this property. So this property was theirs. They didn't have to give this up as long as they remained unmarried. But marriage, once a woman was married, her legal status completely changes. And it changes pretty dramatically. Uh, when women married, as the majority of women did at the time, they still had legal rights, but they no longer had autonomy, which means that they no longer had the right to be in charge of themselves. Um, instead, they find themselves um, in positions of almost total dependency on their husbands. And married women could not own property. So all of that property that I talked about a minute ago, they could not own any of that property. So they couldn't own their own home. They couldn't own their own land. They couldn't sign any um, legal or business agreement. Their husband was also the sole guardian of their children. Now imagine you have children um, and you have no legal rights to those children. Um, so when a, a woman was married and they had children, the husband was full legal custodian, custodian of the children. Um, so if a husband decided that he wanted to leave his wife, he could take the children and the wife had no legal recourse to, to get those children back. Um, husbands could also have their wives committed to insane asylums if they wanted to. There were no divorce laws or no divorce rights for a woman um, unless there was a trial. And in most cases, um, the, the judge would rule in favor of a husband. Um, so women really at this time, if they were married, really did not have many legal rights. Um, and the doctrine that gave these rights to their husband upon marriage is something called coverture. It's C-O-V-E-R P-U-R-E, coverture. And coverture means that a husband and wife were considered to be one person under the law and that women were under the cover or the protection of their husbands. And this, this idea, this idea of coverture is based on the assumption that a family functions best if the male head of a household controlled all of its assets. So again, as a result of this, women, married women could not own property independently of her husband unless they sign a special contract called a marriage settlement. And even if they did sign a marriage settlement, most of the times these marriage settlements were not legal. So if you signed a marriage settlement and as a woman, if you wanted to go to court to fight your husband for something, let's say um, property of your children. Um, custody of your children. Most of the time, even if you did sign this, this marriage settlement, it wasn't legal. So if you went to court, it wouldn't be upheld. So, you know, imagine this, you're in the late 1700s, you're in the 1800s and really moving forward, you as a woman really did not have many rights on your own, especially if you were married. Um, as we kind of move through um, kind of beyond the revolution era, and we move into the 1800s, into kind of the antebellum era, era of, um, of American history, um, the antebellum reform movement um, that paved the way for suffrage. Um, this is the kind of era leading up to the Civil War, so we're covering between about kind of 1800s up until about 1860. Um, in fact, antebellum is Latin and it means before the war. So antebellum before the war, before the Civil War. And women's roles, um, gender roles are something that we really start to talk about here. And women's roles in the household at this time were expected to be in the domestic sphere. Um, and this means that women are really expected to be um, at home, um, maintaining their household. So this means cooking, cleaning, in the laundry, taking care of the children. It's really kind of insular. They're expected to be very domestic. But even though women are expected to be domestic, there's also this emphasis placed on morality. Um, and women are beginning to step outside of the home to advocate for things such as temperance. Um, and temperance is the belief in cutting back the amount of alcohol that a person drinks or in giving it up entirely. Um, they start to advocate for things such as education for women. Women at the time are not allowed to attend colleges or universities. And during this time period, there are a lot of women who are beginning to um, step outside as reformers that are working to increase women's access to education. And they're also stepping out to kind of talk about and advocate for something called abolition. 
Many women are beginning to gather in order to fight the injustices of slavery. Many women that are part of the suffrage movement. So the suffrage movement that we, that we think about today when we're talking about the fight for women's right to vote, um, a lot of the suffrage movement really gets their start. Um, women in the suffrage movement get their start in abolition. So fighting for, um, for slaves' rights and freedom. Um, and two such women who really begin their careers in the abolition movement are the Grimke sisters, who you see here. Um, and I laugh every time I look at this picture because their name, Grimke, I think is very, um, very appropriate. Um, they seem very grim. They don't look like they're having a very good time. Um, however, these two women, this is Sarah Moore Grimke and her sister Angelina Emily Grimke, um, these two women are among the earliest and most famous American women to take a public role in the name of reform. And they are born to a wealthy family in Charleston, South Carolina. So they're born on a plantation. Their, their family owns a plantation. Um, and so they own, their family owns slaves. And so they witness firsthand the horrors of slavery. Um, and they're really repulsed by the treatment of slaves on, on this plantation. And they decide to support the anti-slavery movement. And they want to do this by sharing their experiences on a lecture tour. So they decide that they're gonna travel in the northern part of the United States, not in the South. They're gonna travel in the North and they're gonna do a series of lectures. And at first when they're doing these lectures, they are talking to female audiences. So the only people who are attending these lectures are women. The longer they do this and the more they travel, they start to attract audiences of men and women. Um, and they're met with a substantial amount of harassment and opposition to their public speaking on anti-slavery. And with the amount of harassment that they get from the attendees of, of their lectures, they really begin to see that in order to fight for the right of the slave, they also have to fight for the right of rights of women. So they're really starting to connect the two issues, which is why ab the abolition movement and suffrage movements are really very closely linked together, especially at, at this time period. Um, there are other female abolitionists, um, such as Lucretia Mott um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is a name that I will continue to repeat um, many times over the course of this program, as well as um, part two that you guys will attend in a few days. Um, but, those other abolitionists like Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton all soon joined the Grimke sisters in linking the issues of women's rights and abolition to, um, to the rights of slaves and all of that. So they're, they're really starting to link these two issues. Um, and Lucretia Mott is among, um, in, in 1840, there is something called the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, in London, England. Um, and Lucretia Mott is among the American delegates who are selected to attend this World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Um, however, the organizers of this convention refuse to seat the female delegates that attend, and they don't allow these women to cast votes during the proceeding. Now, if you are attending a convention and you are selected as a delegate and you attend as a delegate, the understanding is that you are going to this convention um, and that you will be able to vote and that you'll be able to participate in what is happening. But the organizers of the convention do not allow any of the female delegates to attend um, and really participate in, the, in this convention. And Lucretia Ma is so angered by this treatment um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who um, also is attending the convention. Now, Lucretia Ma attends the convention as a delegate. Elizabeth Cady Stanton does not. Um, her husband was a delegate, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, attended as because her husband was a delegate, but she's also witnessing kind of exactly what's happening. So Lucretia Ma and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they meet and they start to formulate these ideas and they're so upset by their treatment at this convention that when they come back to the United States, it takes them several years, but in 1848, these two women form and organize the Seneca Falls Convention. And the Seneca Falls Convention is a two-day summit that happens in New York State. Um, and this is where 
women's rights advocates are coming together to discuss the problems that face women. And this is 1848. This is a very new idea for women to gather and to really start voicing their, um, their demands um, to, as, as citizens. Um, and the announcement, when this convention is announced, the announcement reads that the convention is to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. And they say with this two-day summit, the first day of the summit, only women are allowed to attend. So the second day of the summit, they're gonna open it up. Anybody who wants to attend can, but the first day of the summit is only going to be women. So on the first day of this convention, 200 women attend and um, there's something called the Declaration of Sentiments and Grievances that is read. And the Declaration of Sentiments and Grievances is mirrored very closely on the Declaration of Independence. So they're taking the wording of the Declaration of Independence and they're formulating their own document, but the language is very much the same. Um, and within this Declaration of Sentiments, it begins by asserting um, the equality of all men and women. Um, it re reiterates that both genders are endowed with this inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now I'm sure that phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you recognize from the Declaration of Independence. Um, and it also argument, argues that women are oppressed by the government and the patriarchal, patriarchal society of which they are a part now. Patriarchal society is one that is run by men. Um, so they're really saying that um, this, this government and the patriarchal society is really kind of oppressing them. And within this document, um, there are 16 facts that they use to illustrate the extent of the oppression that they see and that they feel and that they're really kind of fighting against. And one of these things, uh, some of these things rather, are the lack of women's suffrage. So they're talking about the lack of, the, of women's right to vote. And in 1848, talking about suffrage is a really radical idea. This is not something that is really widely accepted. It's not really widely understood, and it's certainly not at all popular, but they do include this language in the Declaration of Sentiments and within the convention itself. They are also um, illustrating um, that women have are not able really to participate um, or represent in the government. Um, they're talking about women's lack of property rights in marriage, inequality in divorce law, and also inequality in education and employment opportunities. So they're really, at this time, they're really kind of radical. They're really saying, these are all of the things that we think that we deserve to have. We think that we are not allowed to have these things, and we're going to fight for our right to have these. And the document also insists that women be viewed as full citizens of the United States and that they be granted all of the same rights and privileges that are granted to men. Um, this declaration is read by Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, on July 20th and it's followed by the passage of 12 resolutions that relate to women's rights. Um, and 11 of these 12 resolutions pass unanimously. It means every single person who is attending this convention raise their hand and say, yes, these, these 12 resolutions should pass. Or, I'm sorry, these 11 resolutions should pass. One of these 12 resolutions does not pass unanimously. The only resolution that does not pass unanimously is the resolution in favor of women's suffrage, in favor of women's right to vote. Um, and some of the attendees of the Seneca Falls Convention are really concerned that the issue, again, of suffrage is really very radical. Um, it's too controversial. Um, and they think that it's gonna hurt their efforts for equality in other areas. Eventually this does pass, this, this resolution does pass, but it does not pass unanimously. Um, but 68 women and 32 men, so 100 people total, um, including the abolitionist Frederick Douglass, signed this Declaration of, of Sentiments. However, this declaration, when, when it's made public, um, comes under an, an, a, an intense amount of ridicule and criticism um, and the people who sign it also come under criticism. So many of these people who do sign this document eventually withdraw their name from the document because of how poorly this document is received when it's made public. Um, 
but that's kind of, you know, this is really kind of the catalyst. This is the, the event that kind of starts to get um, the idea of women's suffrage rolling. Um, but there's still this connection to abolitionism. Um, and Sojourner Truth, who um, I'm sure most everybody has heard that name. If you haven't, I'm going to talk a little bit about her. Um, Sojourner Truth is a slave. She's born into slavery. Um, and she's born into slavery. Her master is um, of Dutch. He's Dutch. Um, and she publishes her autobiography in 1850. Um, and she becomes, when she is no longer a slave, when she's freed, she becomes a lecturer on abolition and women's rights. And she's asked to speak in 1851. Um, she's asked to speak at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Um, and she stands up to deliver what has become known as her anti a woman speech. This is a very powerful speech. Um, there's a little bit of controversy surrounding this speech. Um, again, I mentioned that her master was Dutch. And so her, her language, um, how she spoke, her dialect, her accent was kind of this Afro-Dutch accent. Um, and when this speech is, is um, published, um, and it's published within weeks of, um, of, her, of her speaking at this convention, um, that is kind of the widely accepted version as the correct version of the speech. In fact, I believe Sojourner Truth did actually take a look at the transcript and sign off on it saying, yes, this is, this is very accurate to what I spoke. But 12 years after she delivers this speech, so she, she delivers a speech in 1851. In 1863, there's a different version of this speech that is published. And it's really a very incorrect uh, version of this speech. Um, and that speech is, is written in kind of a, what that is considered to be like a slave dialect, kind of this uneducated um, dialect uh, with mispronounced words or um, poor spelling. Um, so I am going to, I'm going to play you the speech. I'm going to play you um, a recording of uh, what is accepted to be her kind of accurate um, portrayal of her speech. And it's spoken by an actor who is of Afro-Dutch descent. So at times it might be a little difficult to understand. However, um, this website that's in front of you, the Sojourner Truth Project, they have a page on their website that compares the two speeches. So it compares the speech that I'm gonna play for you, and it's gonna compare it to kind of that incorrect version that was, that was published in 1863. So you can really get an understanding of the differences between these two speeches. But I'm gonna play the speech for you. Um, it's about two minutes long. Um, and again, some of it might be a little difficult to understand, but if you go to this website, you'll be able to see this speech. It is really kind of a, an important speech. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to play this for you. It's going to be about two minutes. Um, and then, um, and then we will kind of get back to our narrative here. So give me just a second. May I say a few words? I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's right. I have as much muscle as any man and I can do as much work as any man. I have clawed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed. And can any man do better than that? I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and I can eat as much too, if I can get it. I am as strong as any man that is today. As for intellect, all I can say is if a woman have a pint and a man a quart, why can't she have her little pint full? You need not be afraid to give us our right for fear we will take too much for we can't take much more than our pint will hold the poor men seem to be all in confusion they don't know what to do why children if you have woman's right give it to her and you will feel better you have your own rights and there will be so much trouble i can't read 
but I can hear. And I have heard the Bible and learned that Eve caused man to sin. But if woman upset the world to give her a chance to set it right side up again, the lady has spoken about Jesus, how he never spurred woman from him, and she was right. When Lazarus died, Mary and Martha came to him with faith and love and besought him to raise their brother. And Jesus wept, and Lazarus came forth. And how came Jesus into the world? Through God who created him and woman who bore him. Men, where is your part? But women are coming up. Blessed be God, and a few of the men are coming up with him. But men is in a tight place. The poor slave is on him. The women are coming on him. And he is surely between a ha and a buzzard. So again, that is the anti-woman speech as it's generally accepted to be the, the correct version of that speech. And really what she's saying in this speech is, um, anti-woman, doesn't that mean that I am just as good as a man, that what a man does, I am equally as good or can do just as well as a man. So in 1851, when she's standing up to give this speech, when I mentioned that it was a powerful speech, not only is it delivered at a women's rights convention, it's delivered by an African-American woman um, and it's delivered by a former slave. So it's this really kind of powerful moment um, at the kind of beginning of um, the, 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 really the beginning of the women's rights movement. Um, also in 1851, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, um, they meet and they form a lifelong working relationship. And this is very significant because these two women are, their, their relationship is a very important relationship. Um, their friendship lasts many, many decades, um, and they become really two of the, of the biggest names in the women's suffrage movement. Um, they formed something called the, in 1866, they formed something called the American Equal Rights Association. Um, so they co-found this organization. Um, and they also established a newspaper. And the newspaper is called The Revolution. And it's a weekly newspaper that's published between 1868 and 1872 that really becomes the official publication of what will become the National Woman Suffrage Association. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, writes and edits the paper. Susan B. Anthony manages the business affairs. Um, but again, this is the beginning of this friendship for this woman in, women in 1851. And it, it lasts until um, until Susan B. Anthony dies um, in the beginning of the 1900s, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But their friendship um, and their ideas and how they feel about women's suffrage becomes a very powerful friendship as we move forward. Um, and kind of as we move, I, I mentioned the, the antebellum period. So we, we've kind of gotten into the, the antebellum period, but we're moving really into the Civil War. Um, and the Civil War begins in, um, is in the 1860s. Um, and what happens during the Civil War? So we have, in 1848, you have the Seneca Falls Convention, and then you have the Women's Rights Convention in 1851. And there's a lot of this momentum that's starting to build up for women's rights. But when the Civil War hits, that momentum kind of stalls. And it comes to a halt, um, and it, it comes to a halt because many of these, these leaders um, in the women's rights movements, many of those reform leaders are focusing all of their energies into abolition. So there are no women's rights conventions that are held throughout the entirety of the Civil War. Um, and again, abolition becomes a very important part in the early suffrage movement. So I think this really kind of helps them to, to organize and get their thoughts in, in place. Um, but the Civil War is also a time for women to enter professions and leadership roles that were previous, previously closed off to them, um, like nursing, um, 
fundraising, women are kind of stepping outside of the home. They're stepping more into public life. They're taking up jobs like fundraising. So they're raising money for the war effort. Um, they're running hospitals, um, nursing again, as I mentioned, and they're also helping to run the estates while men are off fighting. So women are starting to recognize that they can do these things. They can step outside the home. Their circle is not just within the home, cooking, cleaning, doing laundry, and taking care of the children. They're starting to see that there are things outside the home that they can really get out and do and do effectively. Um, and after the Civil War, there are three constitutional amendments that are passed within a very short amount of time. Um, the 13th Amendment, obviously, is the amendment that abolishes slavery and involuntary servitude. Um, and then the two, in this conversation, the two really important amendments are the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. So the, the 14th Amendment is granting citizenship rights to everyone born in the United States. This includes former slaves. It's guaranteeing all citizens equal protection of the laws. Um, and it's granting voting rights to all male citizens over the age of 21. Now, that's very important to note here that when I say grants voting rights to all male citizens over the age of 21, at this time, it does not include black citizens. These are white citizens. The 15th Amendment is the amendment that grants African American men the right to vote. And in this amendment, it declares that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, very important to note in this amendment that it's granting African-American men the right to vote. It's not granting African-American women the right to vote, and it's not granting women as a whole the right to vote. Um, so these, the 14th and 15th Amendment, kind of become very, um, controversial within the women's rights, um, the American um, Equal Rights Association that was founded by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, and the American Equal Rights Association is really kind of wrecked by disagreements over the 14th and the 15th Amendment. Um, it, because there's this question of whether to support, at the time it was the proposed 15th Amendment, um, which they knew would enfranchise black American men, but they knew that it was going to avoid the question of women's suffrage entirely. Um, so they form, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony form something called the National Women's Suffrage Association. And they found this as kind of a more radical institution. Um, and they are looking to achieve the vote, the right to vote for women. They are looking to achieve the vote through a constitutional amendment. So they want like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. They want a federal amendment. They want the government to say women have the right to vote. So they're fighting for this constitutional amendment, as well as also pushing for other women's rights issues. Um, so they oppose the 15th Amendment for not mentioning women. But they also believe that in the 14th Amendment, they believe that the 14th Amendment grants them the right to vote because the 14th Amendment declares them citizens. And as a citizen, they should be allowed to vote. So that is their belief. That is the National Women's Suffrage Association. That is what they believe in. And then there's this other section that breaks off and they form the American Women's Suffrage Association. And the American Women's Suffrage Association is founded by Lucy Hale, or I'm sorry, Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, and um, another woman called Julia Ward Howe. And this is a more conservative group. Um, and they feel they, they want to start working for women's suffrage for the right to vote. They want to work for this by going to each state individually. And they want to gain women's suffrage by amending individual state constitutions, not the federal constitution, the state constitution. Um, so that's how these two, these two groups, they kind of split off. And again, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they want this federal amendment. Lucy Stone um, and Henry Blackwell and the American Women's Suffrage Association, they want to go state by state and they want to start passing suffrage laws individually by state. Um, and it's really interesting to know, in 1872, 
Susan B. Anthony because, again, Susan B. Anthony and her group believe that the 14th Amendment has given them the right to vote as a citizen. Susan B. Anthony in 1872, um, it's a presidential election, and Susan B. Anthony goes and she casts her ballot for Ulysses S. Grant in the presidential election, and she's arrested. And she's brought to trial in Rochester, New York, and she's fined $100. Now, to you and me today, $100 is a lot of money, but it's not uh, what we consider to be um, a, so much money that you can't pay it, maybe. But in the 1800s, in 1872, when you were fined $100, that would be the equivalent of thousands and thousands of dollars today. So this was a lot of money for the 1800s. And it's, I, I think it's really funny that she actually, she never paid it, um, but she is arrested. And there are also 15 other women who are arrested for illegally voting. In fact, here is the account of the proceedings of the trial of Susan B. Anthony. Her charge is illegal voting, um, the presidential election in November, 1872. And then you also see some names of other, um, of other women who have, um, who have tried to illegally vote. Um, in 1875, um, Virginia Louisa Minor of Missouri tries to register to vote and she is denied. She's not able to, to register to vote and she sues the registrar of the state of Missouri and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decides that suffrage, and this is a very important kind of Supreme Court case, the court decides that suffrage is not a right of citizenship. So again, Susan B. Anthony and Virginia Louisa Minor and some of these other women believe that the 14th Amendment has granted them citizenship. As a citizen, they should be able to vote. The Supreme Court in 1875 in a, in a court case called Minor, M-I-N-O-R versus Happerset, H-A-P-P-E-R-S-E-T-T. -T. In this Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court has said, no, just because you are a citizen does not mean that you are automatically granted the right to vote. Um, and this kind of, um, this is kind of where we're, we're leaving off today is this, this conversation that um, suffrage is not inherently a right of citizenship. Um, and this really begins kind of the renewed momentum of passing suffrage laws. Um, in 1869, the territory of Wyoming, um, it's not a state yet, but in 1869, the territory of Wyoming passes passes a suffrage law, um, and there are other states um, later, which again we get into in part two, um, that start to pass suffrage laws, um, but it's really important um, to kind of take away from today as we move into part two that when I'm talking about state suffrage, I am not talking about presidential elections or voting for your state senator or um, representative in, in the House of, of Representatives. I'm talking about um, more local elections. So if a woman in Wyoming wanted to vote, they could do so, but they're on the more municipal level. So they're, they're voting more for issues that, and things that would really affect them as a woman. Um, so they're not, again, not voting for the presidential elections, they're more local elections that they're allowed to, allowed to vote for. So as we move past today and we, we start getting into tomorrow, that's something to really start thinking about as we start talking about state, state suffrage. Um, and all of this, um, because it becomes very important um, as, as we move the conversation forward. Um, so I am going to end um, my talk right here. Um, but if any of you have any questions, um, please, again, use the chat function. Your questions are only coming to me, so you're sending them to me privately. Um, so please, if you have a question, take a minute. Um, there might be some cases where I um, where I need you to clarify um, something that you ask, so I may ask you to clarify. Um, I apologize if I if I mispronounce your name. That's not my intention. Um, and I also want to remind you that uh, we're looking for questions that are demonstrating um, something that you've that you've heard today. So um, we're talking about just the last.
um, 43 minutes, um, you know, of what you heard today. So that demonstrate your listening for today. Those are the kinds of questions we're looking for. So does anybody have any questions? So Roxy is asking what was written in the Revolution newspaper and was it distributed all around the US? Um, so the Revolution newspaper um, is more of a women's rights newspaper. So they would be talking about issues that were pertaining to women's suffrage or women's rights, um, those kinds of things. And not necessarily distributed all around the United States. I mean, this would not have been like the New York Times. This is a very small publication. Um, so this is something that would have been distributed to a very select group of people. So if you were a member of this organization, if you subscribe to this newspaper, you would receive it, but it's not a national publication like, for example, the New York Times or the Washington Post or something like that is today. Um, so Shay is asking what was different in some states that did allow some of the, uh, what was different in some states that did allow some the right to vote versus states that didn't? Um, Shay, that's going to be something that we get into in part two. Um, but kind of to give you a little preview of it, um, it's really more so the location of the states. Many of the states that begin to pass state suffrage are states in the West as opposed to states in the East. And again, we'll get into that in part two, um, but very good question. So keep it, keep your ear open. Um, in a few days when we when we get into part two and I'll, I'll answer that question within the first few minutes that we talk on um, in part two. Um, Emma is asking what were women allowed to own? Um, so Emma, if you remember the beginning of, um, of the presentation, um, unmarried women, so this is women who had never been married or women who had been married and their husband died, so the widows, um, women, were allowed to own property um, or cash, or stocks, and bonds, livestock, they could own slaves. Married women really didn't own anything. Um, they, everything, if they went into marriage and they owned a house or they owned land or they had money, when they got married, all of that became the property of their husband. So women really were not allowed to own anything um, of their own if they were married. Um, Let's see, the next question is, did you say that men always won in court against women? Um, not always, but I would say 99% of the time, if there was a court case, um, the if, a, if it was a man versus a woman for any particular reason, most of the time, it, the court would rule in favor of the man. Were the Grim, Evelyn is asking, was, were the Grimke sisters family supportive of their abolitionist ideas? Um, no, no, they were not. Um, her family owned slaves. They were plantation owners. Um, and so you can't, can you imagine you are a plantation owner, um, you own slaves and your daughters are, are going around um, talking about abolition and freeing slaves and slaves' rights. Um, so they, their, their family was not very supportive. Now the Grimke sisters didn't get married, so they had a little bit more freedom. Um, so, uh, but no, their, their families were not very supportive. Um, how long was the revolution newspaper around for? From 1868 to 18, 1872, just four years. Um, and it didn't really ever get bigger. Um, again, they're talking about specifically women's issues. Um, so there's a very a much smaller audience for that. Um, but it was just around for four years. Um, oh, so James is asking when fighting for custody over the children were, um, did courts rule in favor of the men? Yeah, yeah. Um, because the, the husband had custody of the children. Legally, men had custody of the children. Women did not. Um, Corinne is asking, were all of the women who were in these movements married or single? Did more married women go to these movements or did more single women go? There was a mix. There were some married women. Um, many of these women were single. Um, I, I would say there were probably more single women that went, but there were, there were married women. So it wasn't just, especially as we're starting to um, 
as we move out of the 1800s and we start getting into the 1900s, um, there are more married women who, um, who are attending, who are becoming much more vocal and participating. Um, and again, we'll talk about this in part two in a few days. Um, but um, there are reasons that married women at this time didn't participate vocally in this movement. Um, but at the time, um, I would say in the time period that we just left off in kind of that post-Civil War era, most of the women who are participating in these are unmarried. But again, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they're married. Um, so some of the, the women who are big names in the movement are married, but many of the participants are not. Um, okay. Natalie is asking, women weren't allowed to have custody of their own kids? No, no, they were not. Um, that is something that um, unless they were widowed, so if they were married and their husband died, they did not have custody of their children. So like I said in the very beginning, once a woman got married, her property, and that's, that includes children, her property belonged to her husband. Um, so women did not have custody of their own kids. And this, this goes on for, for a very long time um, where women didn't have custody of their own kids. I know it's kind of a shocking thing to think about now, um, but at the time period, women really didn't have, they, they didn't have many freedoms and they didn't have many rights. What other aspects of the Civil War were setbacks for the women's suffrage movement? Um, I, I don't know that I would say necessarily setbacks um, because I think the Civil War really, again, we're, they're focusing more on abolition um, because that's a major component of the Civil War. We're talking the 13th Amendment is the emancipation of slaves. Um, but what it does for women, which I think does not have a setback necessarily, um, but as I mentioned, women are getting out and they're fundraising, they are working in hospitals and nurses, they're running estates because their husbands are off fighting. Um, this, I think the Civil War um, got women to recognize that they could do more and that they could be a little bit more involved outside of the house. So I think it may have taken a little bit longer um, because there were so many issues economically um, with the Civil War. It may have taken a little bit longer for the women's right movement to kind of pick up after the Civil War, but I think it really helped women to recognize that there was more that they can do um, rather than, than just being more domestic. When the Grimke sisters, Hillary is asking, when the Grimke sisters went to the North and spoke out, were they harassed? Yes, yes they were. Um, and it was verbal harassment. Um, I'm sure they probably had things thrown at them. They were probably spit on. Um, so yelled at, um, not called very nice names. Yes, they were harassed. Were there any major events? Roxy is asking, were there any major events with women during the Civil War when the men were away? Um, you might have to clarify that, um, Roxy, because um, I'm not entirely sure I know what you're talking about. Um, Zachariah is asking, what role did state governments play in extending voting rights to women? Um, this is gonna be something, I don't wanna get too far into this because this is something we'll talk about in part two. Um, and um, your teacher is saying that we can do part two on Wednesday at, at 10 a.m. So we'll get that set up. Um, but the state governments in extending voting rights to women, if we're talking about passing state suffrage, not federal stuff, suffrage, if we're talking about state suffrage, um, those, those states, they're allowing women the right to vote. So women can legally go to, um, on election day, they can legally go and they can cast a ballot. Not again, they cannot cast a ballot for president, but they can cast ballots for um, like school board elections or, or something like that that would really affect them as women. Uh, were there, okay, so the clarification is, were there any major events with women during the Civil War when the men were away, like historic events that changed women's rights? Um, nothing historic, um, nothing, um, no Supreme Court cases or really anything like that. It's really more so um, being able to become nurses um, and, you know, fundraise 
um, and run the estates. Um, that those are really the the major events or issues that I'm talking about during the Civil War. Um, Cody is asking during the Civil War, did women get punished after fundraisers? Um, no, because they they weren't um, they were they were raising money for the war effort. So they were. Um, like during World War II, there were there were bonds and you know all of these things that raise money for the war effort. Th those are the kinds of things that they're doing. Um, so they're trying to get people to donate money um, for the war effort, for supplies, um, and in those kinds of things. Um, okay, I can take. I'm going to take one more question. So if if anybody else has a question, send it in. But I can do one more question. Okay, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, I'm gonna leave you for today. Um, and again, I'm gonna move into part two. I'll do a little bit of a recap. If you think of any questions from today that you wanna ask on Wednesday, um, we can certainly um, kind of ask those questions. Um, and um, other than that, I am gonna leave you for today. And thank you so much for your wonderful questions and your participation. And I very much look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday. So bye everybody.